Good evening and welcome to the ARC GAP webinar. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to learn more about our programs. Before we begin, I would like to note a few things about how a webinar works if you are not familiar. There is a toolbar on the right hand side of the page and if you notice, we have muted all of you. We have a lot of people on this evening so this keeps background noise to a minimum. This is an interactive experience however, so if you do have questions, please feel free to type them in and a director will get back to you or we will address it at the end of the presentation for everyone to hear. We have people from all over the country joining us tonight, so welcome everyone. Our presentation should last about 50 minutes, potentially 60, and hopefully by the end you'll have a much better sense of the types of semesters we offer here at ARC. So my name is Margot Brookfield and I am a GAP director here at ARC GAP. A little bit more about me, I have been with ARC for over six years now. I started out as a leader in 2015, including leading our Latin America and East Africa GAP semester programs before transitioning into the office in January of 2017. Since joining the office, I've had the opportunity to direct our South America, Himalaya, East Africa, Central Caribbean, and Northwest GAP semester programs, not all at once, but building, scouting, and designing these programs has been a true joy and passion of mine. So with me here on the GAP team are Sophia Weeks and Emily Rosser. Sophia is our executive director and has been with ARC for 12 years now and actually led our first ever GAP semester in East Africa in 2011. She has built and designed all of our GAP semesters here at ARC and currently directs our South, Southwest semester. That's a problem, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the ARC GAP webinar. I apologize, I had some technical difficulties there. Turns out the audio wasn't working, but I appreciate your patience, and we certainly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to learn more about our programs. So before we officially begin, I would like to note a few things about how a webinar works, if you are not familiar. So there is a toolbar on the right hand of the page, and if you notice, we have muted all of you.
Hey folks, so sorry about that. We're going to give this another go. And if you can, if you can't hear me, or if or if you can, maybe just message Emily, let her know that we're all good to go. Maybe it's her computer having some issues. But anywho, um, not sure where where we cut off there. But before we begin, I would like to note a few things about how webinar works. If you're not familiar, uh, so there's a toolbar on the right hand page, and if you notice, we've muted all of you. We do have a lot of people on this evening, so this keeps background noise to a minimum. However, this is meant to be an interactive experience. So if you do have questions, please type them into Emily in that chat box there and she'll get right back to you, or we will address it at the end of the presentation for everyone to hear. So we do have people from all over the country with us tonight. So welcome everyone. Um, hoping to keep this now. I'd like to have you all out of here by 5 p.m. Pacific time. So we'll see what we can do there. Um, but again, my name is Marco Brookfield. I'm a GAP director here at ARC GAP. So a little bit more about me, I have been with ARC for over six years now. I started out as a leader in 2015, including leading our Latin America and East Africa GAP semester programs before I transitioned into the office in January of 2017. So since joining the office, I've had the opportunity to direct a number of our GAP semester programs, and building, scouting, and designing these programs has really been a true joy and passion of mine. So again, here with me on the GAP team are Sophia Weeks and Emily Rother. Sophia is our executive director, and she's been with ARC for about 12 years now, and actually led our first ever GAP semester in East Africa in 2011. She has since built and designed all of our GAP semesters, and currently directs our Southwest, Central Caribbean, and Pacific Islands semesters. Additionally, Emily, who I mentioned is here on with me tonight on questions. She's another GAP director on the team, and she is in charge of our Southeast Asia, Himalaya, and Hawaii GAP semester programs. She has led two global gap year programs for another organization in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and is passionate about this growing field. So we are speaking to you tonight from our headquarters in Bend, Oregon. We moved here about four years ago from our previous location in the Bay Area, where we were for roughly 25 years. So this has been a great move for us. It's a super inspiring place to work, and the outdoor adventurous environment proves to help us create some pretty amazing trips around the world. We are a mom and pop company here, so you can reach any of us, including our executive director, George Hoke, simply by calling us. Um, just a little more housekeeping again for those of you who are new to, to webinars. Um, again, you all are on mute, but please feel free to chat any questions that you have to Emily in that questions or chat box there on the right-hand side. And if it is a question that many people are asking, Emily will pass it on to me and I will go over it at the end of the presentation. I do encourage you all to hold your questions for a little while. We are going to cover a lot this evening, so hopefully we get all those questions answered for you. A bit more about ARC. Our first trips departed in the summer of 1983 and were run by our founder, Lisa Halstead. If you notice we call ourselves ARC, the R comes from the fact that we were originally called Adventures Rolling Cross Country. But as our company has expanded and evolved over the years, we decided to drop the rolling. However, we did keep the R, since many people know us as ARC and ACT didn't sound quite as good. So we have kept the name ARC and actually we were Adventures Cross Country for a number of years. And today we just refer to ourselves as ARC programs, and then we have ARC GAP and ARC summer programs. So at the time, Lisa organized a small group of students with one other leader and packed a fan, van full leaving New Jersey and drove across the U.S. to experience the wilderness and what happens with team building, group dynamics, and personal growth in these experiences. And since then, we've evolved tremendously. We now travel to 22 different countries around the world, um, all while ma maintaining those founding themes that have made our program so successful. So we are a company that... Having been around for this our 40th summer coming up, uh, we do run with incredible legitimacy and become a, a presence in the larger market for both our summer and gap year programs, um, given how long we've been around. So our mission is, is significant. It is to provide unique, life-changing educational experiences in places rarely visited and situations seldom experienced. So I'm going to go into this a little bit more just to give you all a little bit more context. So unique and life-changing. So we do spend a great deal of time establishing relationships with the people and organizations and partners that we work with all over the world to enable these experiences for our students. So these programs are really meant to be unlike anything a teenager has ever experienced. It is not a tour, it is not a vacation. However, it is a chance to go places and see things that people often only dream of. So this might mean attending a Maasai wedding in Tanzania, helping out on a Costa Rican ranch, or taking care of your own elephant while at an elephant sanctuary in Thailand. Um, and these, these experiences are all enabled through, at times, decades-long partnerships, which we're going to chat a little bit more about. At their core, our programs are meant to be educational. So a, a great deal of learning goes into these semesters, which we will discuss in more detail later as well. 
um, but they're about experiencing cultural differences and learning about the struggles or challenges facing the communities that we are visiting um, and understanding solutions with the various partners that we're working with um, and learning about also lessons that we can bring back home and what we can do back home as well. Um, these programs are not meant to be academic. They're not meant to be like school, but really that hands-on experiential education. So rarely visited, you know, this goes back to that uniqueness aspect as well. Um, with our partnerships that we've curated over many, many years, we often get to go places that you wouldn't typically find yourself seeing if you were just traveling on your own or on a vacation or something like that. Um, and these are critical elements taken into consideration when we create our semesters. And by the end of the semester, we really want our students saying, gosh, can you believe everything that we have done? So a little bit more about our students as well. So we do have eight to 13 students per group. And this is a nice, small, intimate environment. And that's really important to us because we want to make sure that the group is not too large, that students are lost in the shuffle, or that we are taking over a community that, we're, that we are showing up in. Um, but we want it to be small and intimate and with an opportunity to have a significant experience with your group and get to know one another on more of that family level. Um, and it really does become instrumental to the overall experience and learning for the group. Um, the group travel can be challenging at times, but often for most students, their group ends up being one of their biggest highlights of their experience with us. Our students range in age from 17 to 20 years old. So most of our students are on a you know, quote unquote traditional gap experience, have just graduated from high school, but we do get some who are either early graduates from high school or those who have maybe done a semester or year of college and are now taking gap time, maybe transferring or just need a break, um, whatever the reason may be. But at, at their core, our students really want to be here. So a really important piece of, you know, especially what we're looking for when we're admitting students is that they want to be here and be a part of this GAP experience. Um, ARC is not a program for students who are coming out of a youth at risk environment or something like that. Um, we want students who are going to buy into the program, especially being that it's, it's such a long period of time. We need to make sure that students are coming for the right reasons. So that's why we do have a, an application process that students have to complete that includes a detailed application, two to three outside references, um, which includes one academic and one character reference, as well as a mental health reference for any student who's seen a therapist in the last four years, as well as a subsequent interview. So that's kind of the overview of our application process. But, um, you know, we want students who are ready to jump outside their comfort zones and push themselves and be a part of this group experience. A little more about our instructors. So, Gosh, our instructors are instrumental in creating these experiences for our students. So all of our programs have two instructors who are typically in their mid to late 20s, if not early 30s, and have ex extensive experience, um, you know, in country or in the regions that they're traveling to, um, and it's applicable language experience primarily for our Latin America programs. They are passionate and motivating, and they know how to run safe programs for young adults and how to connect with them. So they really do play an important role throughout the semester, serving as mentors, as teachers, sometimes as big brother, big sister, um, friends or, or parents or behavior, you know, behavioral when needed. Um, we do require all of our instructors to complete a rigorous 80-hour uh, medical training course called a Wilderness First Responder. This is just one step below an EMT. So this is a very important training for them in the event that any sort of medical emergency were to arise during the program. Additionally, they have about 15 days of staff training with us prior to heading into the field, and that is in addition to the various experiences that got them the job, obviously. But most importantly, our instructors are dynamic people with a proven reputation and experience working for ARC, and they are so excited to work with our students. So a little bit more about our partners. I know I mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, but you know, we're often asked, how are you able to run safe programs in East Africa, in Southeast Asia, in South America, et cetera? How, how do you have these intimate connections? So we feel it's important to note that we have developed, nurtured, and maintained relationships with our in-country partners over many years at times, um, and often <laughs> many years. We trust our partners to create dynamic itineraries and also maintain some flexibility. Obviously, things can change when traveling. Um, and they work with us to find projects that are going to be really meaningful and impactful, not only for our students, but for anyone that we're working with along the way. And they also help with you know, our safety protocols, which we'll chat a little bit more about as well. But they are really crucial to the planning and implementation of our programs and logistics on the ground. So it is these relationships that make our programs what they are. Yes, our safety record. It, it really is unmatched. After 40 years of running programs, certainly we have extensive risk management protocols. Um, and it's important when you're considering sending your student on an adventure for two to three months to, to think about what if something happens? You know, what infrastructure is in place? 
So we are proud of our safety record and we do attribute it to being proactive in the field and to hiring mature and responsible instructors who go through that intensive, you know, ADR medical training and our staff training and preparation as well, ensuring that they can create a safe environment for all of our students and act appropriately in the case of an emergency. So we do have infrastructure safety protocols and if something does happen we make sure our students are always taken to you know clean safe clinics and that families are kept in the loop throughout anything like that that might be happening on a program additionally we do have an after hours emergency contact that needed 24 7 when we have students in the field with us and we do have communication protocols set up between us at the office our instructors our families as well as our in-country partners So a little bit more just about our general programming. Um, we do have a few different program categories here at ARC. So we have our summer and custom programs that we offer for teenagers and school groups for sixth through 12th graders. Um, so primarily these are during the summer, though the custom programs could, could be any time of year, which is specifically with school. And then we have our GAP programs, which are offered in the fall and spring. And I'll go a little bit more over all the regions that we go to, but we're, we're, we're all over the map these days. So lots of different program offerings. So I imagine at this point, since you're here, you probably know what a gap semester is, but just as a, a brief overview, what is a gap year? Um, so this is something that has been quite common around the world for a number of years. It's only recently picked up in the, significantly in the United States, maybe in the last 10 years or so, but it's meant to be a natural break between high school and college, a time for students to gain maturity and perspective, awareness, to grow in their leadership skills, um, and it's an opportunity to unplug from the everyday classroom and that sort of K through 12 treadmill that many students are on and reboot in a way that's more experiential. Um, everyone can relate to experiential education, getting their hands dirty with something and actually experiencing it. Students often gain a better sense of identity, of self-confidence and an ability to connect with you know, real world experiences to some extent. And it gets students to connect to their, you know, what they're reading and apply it to where they actually are and what they're doing. Um, so we do have some of that as part of our curriculum too, but to, to have that be more applicable and then really use it going forward. Um, we have found from our years of running gap semesters that this often inspires students in the path that they follow in college, maybe later on into careers or if nothing else, you know, hobbies and passions that they have moving forward after their gap year. So we do have five pillars of our ARC GAP programming, um, and this is an important framework with which we build up upon our programs. So they are the foundation and essence of the semester. We've got education, we have cultural immersion, we have leadership development, we have this project-based learning, and of course, adventure, and with that often comes fun. Gotta have fun on your GAP year. So I'm gonna dig into these a little bit more and give you a little bit more context. But so for the educational curriculum, this is really, it is a big piece of our semesters. And again, it's not meant to be academic, but we want students learning more on their semester than just going through the, going through the steps of being your average tourist or traveler in a place, but really digging more deeply and engaging with the place that they are. Um, so we have six global themes that are applicable for all of our programs. They are listed here, but that is environment and conservation, the movement of people, literacy and education, public health, Indigenous rights and histories, and social justice. So these really are the, the core of our framework for our educational curriculum. But the way that students are exposed to these themes is really through the projects. So through partnering with local organizations to do research, to conduct interviews, to join in on ongoing projects, to really get their hands dirty. Um, students spend time working alongside you know, community members, community leaders, and gain a deeper understanding of what, what's going on in that place. Um, so the curriculum is really to enhance that experiential learning. Um, so in addition to those hands-on experiences, we have a few ways that that's done. They, they might be listening to talks from local experts. They might be, you know, reading in their course reader here. These students are being a little silly with theirs, but reading short articles and snippets about what they're doing. They might be listening to podcasts or TED Talks or watching documentaries. So there's a lot of ways that that's brought in. Additionally, throughout the semester, students ha are working on what's called a capstone passion project. And this allows students to focus on one or more theme, and it doesn't have to be one of the ones that I mentioned, but, but something related to the place that they are, and use that as a thread to connect the different you know, countries, states, communities that they're visiting throughout that time. And at the, end of the, at the end of the program, students present their topics through, ideally an artistic medium of some sort, we do discourage essays and PowerPoints. I'm sure you all have done your fair share of those in high school students, but um, it might be a photo essay, it might be a, uh, gosh, we've had board games, we've had cookbooks, we've had those documentary film shorts, um, whatever it is that speaks to your creative passion and, and passions and interests. Um, but these projects really do allow students to explore their, their curiosity and their interests 
um, in a way that, that is exciting and engaging to them. So the hands-on projects, this is a major component of the semester. So we are working with organizations that are already established and projects that are locally driven. Our goal here is really sustainability in the projects that we're doing. This is not meant to be like volunteerism, um, but really it's working with an organization, lending a hand, potentially you know, offering resources, and ultimately learning is the big piece of this. Um, our students are given the opportunity to be a part of these projects and see what these organizations are trying to accomplish. So it's important to us that they are sustainable and already in place and our Students are just lending a hand and you know it's a mutually beneficial exchange there. Additionally, cultural immersion. This is huge and might be more applicable for our international programs than domestic, though there's certainly some of this on our domestic programs as well. But certainly cultural is experienced every day. It's why students are taking a gap, ex a gap semester, gap year, gap experience um, to immerse themselves in cultures they are unfamiliar with and to broaden their own horizons and perspectives. So especially in the international programs, we do this through home stays, through community stays, um, participating in traditional ceremonies such as is pictured here, um, local activities, and really just giving the students the opportunity to um, be as, as engaged as they can with the local communities and culture everywhere they're going. Leadership is another one of our pillars. So this is important for students, especially at this age, to grow in their leadership um, you know, abilities and skills. So this is done through what we call leader of the week. So students are stepping up into leadership roles, formal and informal throughout the course of their semester. They're learning more about their leadership styles. They are get, learning to give and receive feedback. Conflict resolution is a big piece of this. Um, they're working together. They are setting goals. And um, this all sort of culminates in what's called our student plan module. This is a part of all of our semesters. And it's usually two, two thirds of the way through the semester or so where students are given a budget, they're given parameters, and they have to figure out where they're going, how they're getting there, what they're doing, where they're staying, what they're eating. They've got to work together to figure out all of that um, and learn to travel on a budget too, which is an important skill for them moving forward in life. So um, and the most common feedback we get after a program from parents often is a noticeable increase in confidence and self for their students. So um, a big piece of this we think is attributed to this leadership development curriculum. And last but not least, adventure. Like I mentioned, if, you know, gotta have some fun on your gap year. All of our programs have some sort of adventure component. And this varies obviously depending on what region of the world you're traveling in, but you might find yourself taking surf lessons or whitewater rafting or going on hiking or back, going on hikes, backpacking, getting scuba certified, um, just to name a few of the opportunities that could await, but um, a lot of fun activities also to engage further in the outdoors and the places that you are. I'm sure you all have questions around our response to, you know, COVID, to the pandemic, our current protocols. Um, so, I, you know, fortunately, we were able to kind of pivot very quickly, given our longstanding relationships here, running programs domestically in the United States. When, when the pandemic hit, we were able to swiftly evacuate all of our students from the various places that they were around the, around the world as borders were closing. Um, we even had one group who was in the back country of Patagonia and we got them home within 24 hours. So we are, were able to respond quickly when it first arose and then pivot to domestic programming thereafter with very stringent COVID protocols in place. Um, we were able to safely operate programs in 2020 and have continued to safely run programs for students since then. Um, so, you know, and with that, we've been starting to bring back our international programs last spring and fall slowly this spring we're, we're bringing back more of our international programs we are you know very excited to be able to do so and we've been dealing with unusual although this was certainly unprecedented but but unusual situations for nearly 40 years um, whether that be local politics or natural disasters um, you know we are used to responding to those sorts of things and and pivoting and making changes as needed so our refund policy is that, you know, and it, this is around COVID and also just generally speaking, um, our fall deadline for a part, there is an $800 deposit to officially hold one space on a program. For the fall programs, you can get a partial refund of $300 up until June 1st if you were to withdraw. And for the spring programs, that deadline is November 1st. The exceptions to this are if we were to, for some reason, cancel a program before it begins, we would refund your deposit in full or allow you to switch to another program that is still operating that season or in a future season. Um, so certainly we are trying to be as flexible as we can be with families and, and being as transparent as we can be too with programs that might be canceled or that might not, but we certainly I think are hitting our stride in terms of not having to cancel programs um, you know, once we start enrolling students for them at this point in time and, and looking forward to continuing to bring back more of those and, and hopefully not have to cancel <laughs> anything moving forward. 
So in terms of our protocols on program, these are changing based on, you know, local uh, regulations in country based on what's happening here with the Center for Disease Control. So we're constantly monitoring that. But we do have protocols around, you know, masks and testing. And we do require full vaccination of students and staff participating in an arc gap semester. Um, but ultimately, we do send out our COVID protocols and what they will look like for that particular upcoming semester, um, typically a few weeks, if not a month before the program begins, just so that we have the most up to date things as possible, um, and which could change or need to be adjusted moving forward. And we do appreciate families' flexibility with us there. Okay, now on to, to more fun stuff. So here's our semester destination. So we do have a number of different programs that we offer, both domestically here in the United States. We, like I said, we brought those about when the pandemic hit and we have really loved having domestic programming back on our GAP programs. So we've, we've, we're keeping them around. We love these programs. Um, and we do have a variety of international programs as well. So I'm gonna go into some details about each of these programs. I'm gonna start with the domestic programs and then I'm going to launch into the international programs. So this will just be a brief brief highlights overviews. Again, I wanna make sure that we don't go too far over this evening since we've had a lot to cover. Um, but I'm gonna start with the Hawaii semester. So this program is a fall and spring semester. A big note about our domestic program. So all of our domestic programs, the Hawaii, Northwest, and Southwest semesters are primarily camping-based programs. So it's definitely something important to note as you're looking at programs. If you're ready to kind of be out living outdoors, students are cooking for themselves, they're learning those skills of budgeting and shopping and, and cooking, um, as well as living outside for the majority of the program, uh, definitely a big note about these semesters. I'm just going to go into some of the highlights and main projects of this program. But the Hawaii program does travel to three islands. It is um, Maui, the Big Island, and Oahu. And I'm going to start with this first project is, you know, surfing. Actually, students get to do surf lessons on all three of the islands, which is super fun, kind of build on those skills as they're progressing throughout the semester. And then there's a habitat restoration project here that students are engaging in, which is working with a local nonprofit to preserve the nesting grounds for the threatened lace and albatross on the north shore of Oahu. So for this, students are removing invasive plants, outplanting natives that birds use for their nests, and protecting areas from predators. Um, they learn about the behind the scenes workings of an environmental nonprofit in this region. Um, so really just getting their hands dirty with this project um, on Oahu. Additionally, we have a coral reef education project where students are working with a local environmental org that monitors Hawaii's bays and the impacts of tourism on coral reefs. Um, so this organization is working to educate beachgoers about reef safe sunscreens and how to be reef friendly at the beach. Um, what sorts of things they might see while snorkeling. So students get to really dive into this and work with this organization also for their own understanding. Okay, you know, what are reef safe sunscreens? What are some things that I should be mindful of when I'm going to the beach or anywhere near the ocean um, to be as sustainable as I can? Um, additionally, students are getting their scuba certification. So this is super fun. You know, it's typically a four day course. There's some previous, there are some e-learning that students do ahead of time. And then they have about three to four days of diving in the water. Um, Super fun and also, you know, continuing that education about kind of marine conservation, marine science, and, uh, you know, coral reef restoration. Next, students are doing a food security project um, and certainly learning a lot about food security on the islands, which is a big issue. Um, so this is multiple projects throughout the program that will touch on this, but these include uh, working on a permaculture farm and learning about sustainable farming near the YPO Valley. Um, additionally, students are working at the University of Hawaii Maui College doing an aquaponics, permaculture, and vermiculture sort of workshop. Um, so learning about all those on campus at Maui College. Additionally, a huge highlight of this program is going to Volcanoes National Park on the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, as the youngest of the main islands, they get to see the unique ecosystem and recent lava flows, um, how these have you know, created the Hawaiian Islands. And then we also work within the national park to remove invasive species. So working with an organization that is in, in the park, uh, removing Himalayan ginger and working on trail reparations and such within the park. Additionally, students explore the lava flows from the 2018 eruption. And they also get to visit Mauna Kea, which is, fun fact, the tallest mountain on the planet when it's measured from the seafloor. And students often go up at night and they'll get to stargaze from, from the peak, which is pretty awesome. Um, and also students do get to do a nighttime snorkel with manta rays to see them feeding, which is, as I'm sure you can imagine, been a highlight of this program. 
And lastly, we have an ancient fish pond restoration project on the Hawaii program. So students are working with local foundations to restore and maintain an ancient fish pond that once served as a sustainable source of protein for the community. They also explore the Hawaiian culture and take part in traditional cooking and blessing ceremonies. This is really throughout the program. Students are really engaging in in learning about Hawaiian history, Hawaiian culture, um, through all the partners that we're working with throughout the program. Next up is our Northwest semester. Um, so this program travels to Utah, Wyoming, Montana, Washington State, and then Hawaii. Number of, of highlights here, this is also a camping-based program. Um, students are road tripping with a van and trailer on this semester, kind of starting in Utah, heading west, and then flying to Hawaii for the end of the program. So this program begins in the Tetons um, and doing Yellowstone explore conservation as well. So within the Jackson Hole area, students are they're hiking, they're kind of acclimating to outdoor living. Um, they do a one-day visit with this Teton Science School who really digs into uh, kind of local issues to the area, looking at the education system, looking at kind of urbanization, um, you know, lots of people moving into the Jackson area, how that's affecting the local economy, et cetera. And then students have a couple days free to hike in the Tetons and explore. And then they move on to their project in Yellowstone, which is learning about, you know, wolf conservation, grizzlies, as well as bison. And they're doing tracking with local conservationists who are experts in the region. Um, so far, knock on wood, all of our students have seen all three of these species. It's been pretty special. Taking naturalist classes, um, learning about the stewardship of public lands, the history of Yellowstone National Park, um, and then, of course, visiting Old Faithful and some of those major landmarks in the area. Students also get their wilderness first responder on this program, um, which is what we do require of our instructors. So they are doing that, um, about a six day course for this, uh, where they're taking classes, they're doing hands-on practical, you know, building splints as shown here, things like that. Um, really fun course and super applicable for students for any future recreating they might be doing in the outdoors. And then students are also partnering with Habitat for Humanity while they are in northeastern Washington in a more smaller, more rural community, um, but helping to, to do home refurbishment. Um, most recently, the students were helping to build, you know, parts of prefab homes for families who've lost their homes due to wildfires, as we know, have ravaged the, the um, Pacific Northwest the last couple of summers. So that's been a really great project for students. Um, and... Additionally, students are making a stop in Glacier National Park. Not, not pictured here, but that is going to be a part of the itinerary moving forward. And then as they continue west, students go to, to, through Washington State. Um, they have a couple of stops along the way, but uh, highlights would be in the Seattle area, um, kind of exploring and looking at major landmarks, going to Pike's Place Market, looking at the Space Needle, um, learning about some other historical things there, hopefully getting some talks from uh, a few um, immigration organizations in the region, such as the International Rescue Committee and such. And then students are setting up at a permaculture farm on the Olympic Peninsula. So they work on the farm for a week. Um, it's really a sustainable sort of intentional community as well. So students are learning more about that intentionality. Um, often in the fall, it's apple harvesting season. They get to make and press apple cider after they pick all the apples, um, but really learning about sustainability here as well. Uh, and then they do a marine study in the San Juan Islands and kayaking. So students do get to go out on kayak through the San Juan Islands, um, you know, hopefully seeing a whale or, or other fun wildlife during that time. Um, they do get to spend some time on Orcas Island and do other sightseeing in the San Juans. And then they spend some time in Winthrop, Washington, which is just outside of North Cascades National Park, where we are working with a local expert who uh, specializes in cougar tracking. And students get to go out and learn about not only tracking all wild, not only tracking cougars, but all wildlife um, in the area, and comparing that as well to the conservation project in Yellowstone. And last but not least, Hawaii, of course, a major highlight of the program. Here, students are going to be doing. Um, you know, rounding out their semester, really, they will be getting their scuba certifications as well, that four-day course, um, and then they will also be volunteering in Volcanoes National Park, as our Hawaii groups do, um, doing invasive species removal, learning about conservation there, um, you know, seeing the, seeing the lava, hopefully driving over Mauna Kea as they go from the Hilo to the Kona side of the island, and they also do surf lessons to round out the program. All righty, next we have our Southwest semester. Um, so again, domestic program, it is road tripping with a van and trailer, and we do have, um, yes, a camping-based program overall. This program travels to Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and California. 
So some highlights here, this, this program also has a Wilderness First Responder Certification. Uh, the students start in Salt Lake City and then head down to Moab for the certification um, through that you know, six to eight day course that they are doing. And then additionally, they get to explore, I mean, obviously Moab is a mecca of national parks all around there, but explore Arches National Park um, and hopefully watch the sunset over Delicate Arch. Um, and potentially, if they have time, visit some of the other national parks in the area. Next, they have some time working at a bison ranch as well as a wolf sanctuary, so bringing in some of that wildlife conservation. Um, so students are, this is in western Colorado, they visit a few different ranches to learn about bison, as well as cattle ranching, um, the importance of family farming in this region, and also important to understanding, you know, where our food comes from. Um, so additionally, they are learning about water usage and irrigation rights in these places, I um, mean, especially on those farms and such. They also will go rock climbing in Colorado National Monument and then work at a wolf sanctuary as pictured here. This has been an incredible project that we've been working with in Colorado um, that is you know, rehabilitating wolves. So uh, really unique opportunity to get up close with, with these wild animals and, and learn more about conservation in the region. So next we have Cataract Canyon rafting trip and learning about wa water sustainability study. So right now they go rafting through, yes, it's a multi-day rafting trip on Cataract Canyon. Um, additionally, students are working with the Glen Canyon Field Institute to learn about the effects of the Hoover Dam and Lake Powell. So learning more about, yeah, just water rights, water issues, sustainability there. Um, then for this, camp, for this uh, river trip, they are, you know, camping along the riverbanks, sleeping under the stars. It's a really beautiful way to get out there and see the world pass in a different way from the water. Alrighty, next up is our eco-housing build and Native History and White Sands National, National Park. Um, so students are going to Taos, where they're Taos, New Mexico, where they're working with an organization called Earthships that is doing hands-on projects to build and basically build in the most sustainable way possible, learning about renewable energy. All of their building is done with recycled materials. So, you know, joining in on that, learning about renewable energy sources. Um, students do visit the Taos Pueblo Cultural Center and meet with members of New Mexico's Native American Community Academy. Um, so given the circumstances of COVID, students will not be immersing deeply in this, but it is an important topic to be mindful of when traveling in this region in particular. Um, and then lastly, visiting White Sands, which is a beautiful national park and is actually the newest in the United States. Next up, we have the Borderlands Immigration Project as well as surfing and sea kayaking. So students here are going to be learning about immigration reform and initiatives on the U.S. southern border. So they're paired with buddies to shadow for a week at various local organizations in the Phoenix area. So really digging in more, of course, this is a big issue down in those states. So digging into that and learning about the issues related to that in the region. Um, and then they get to go surfing and take surf lessons and go see kayaking to round out their semester. Alrighty, next up we are moving into our international program. Um, so the first of which is our Central Caribbean program. And this program is traveling to Costa Rica, Panama, and Belize. Um, Cuba, unfortunately, we have for the time being removed from this itinerary just due to, you know, local restrictions and politics in the region. We are not able to go right now. Our partners are not ready for us and various COVID restrictions. Um, but the other three countries have been great so far as we've been operating this program most recently. So first up, students are doing a Spanish language school. So certainly, you know, digging into Spanish language throughout this program. Um, during this time, they are going to be in home stays, uh, COVID permitting, but they we have brought those back for Costa Rica. So far, it's been super successful. All the families are vaccinated and there's kind of separate quarters for the students. But doing home stays, digging into Spanish language, students are broken up into beginner, intermediate, and advanced level courses. And then they're also doing a stay at a local ranch in Costa Rica where they're learning about, again, kind of sustainability, learning about farming, learning about, um, you know, food sources and what that looks like and helping out at various, um, various projects around the ranch. And this has been a project we've been doing for a number of years. So it's very cool to see students continue going back there. Next up is our sea turtle conservation and wildlife sanctuary. So for these projects, both really incredible. Um, the Wildlife Sanctuary is a place that houses, you know, mammals and reptiles, all sorts of animals um, from the Costa Rican jungle, and it's meant to re rehabilitate them. So often students are helping to, you know, build and repair the habitats at the sanctuary, doing feedings, um, you know, whatever it is that they need help with, but really learning more about that wildlife conservation. And then with the Sea Turtle Project, students are you know, working at, at the organization that's located on the beach. It's a very, very small town. And they are going out and monitoring the beaches at night looking for nesting sea turtles. Um, we've definitely been lucky in the past with students actually seeing nesting sea turtles where they're then catching the eggs, taking them to the hatchery. Um, 
doing all the monitoring and recording and reporting and all of that. So super hands-on project. It's been really special. And then hopefully seeing the little eggs hatch and um, releasing the hatchling Babsi, which is a really cool experience. Next is the Monteverde Institute. Um, this is an, org uh, well, an educational center, all sorts of things where students are learning about sustainability efforts um, in the cloud forest in Costa Rica. Um, this has been an awesome project. Students are on the grounds of the institute working hand in hand with local experts. It's been really awesome. Um, and then additionally, you know, like the fun activities brought in here, students do get to take surf lessons in Uvita, Costa Rica, and they also get to do a multi-day rafting trip on the Pacuari River in Costa Rica, which has been super, super fun, uh, really fun river to run. Next up, this is in Panama. We do our rural community health initiative and Boca del Toro um, exploration. So this is a super awesome project. Um, and it is basically setting up pop-up clinics in remote villages throughout the Bocas del Toro Islands. So our students are, are assisting in the non-medical tasks. They're often working in the front desk. They're checking patients in. They're doing some of the, the reporting and such. They're learning more about, you know, access to healthcare in super remote parts of Panama. So that's been a really impactful project for our students. Um, and then exploring the Bocas del Toro Islands, which, of course, are just stunning and beautiful. Um, and also, while they're in Panama, I probably most likely it's visiting the Panama Canal Museum and spending some time in Panama City. And then lastly, we do have our projects in Belize, and this is cut off a little bit here, but we do have our, our marine project um, as well as scuba diving certification. So this is where students are. It's a private island where they're getting scuba certified while learning about um, conservation on the coral reef. This is the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, which is actually the second largest in the world to the Great Barrier Reef. And students are learning about lionfish as an invasive species and how they're impacting the local populations of other fish and the reef itself. So they're, they're actually helping to, you know, spear lionfish, learn about this, um, and do some monitoring in, in the a monitoring project as well with the, with the local organization. That's the Central Caribbean program now on to East Africa. This program travels to Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. This is a fall only program. Uh, it also finishes off in Zanzibar, which is an island off the coast of Tanzania. So another thing to note about this program, this is also a camping-based semester where students are traveling in an overland safari vehicle. Um, so it's kind of similar to our domestic programs in some ways. They're road tripping, they're camping, they're living outside, they're cooking for themselves. That's certainly a big piece of the experience on this program. Um, but first up in Uganda, we do have a rhino sanctuary where students are working with local rangers on this sanctuary grounds, um, learning about poaching and issues that are related to conservation of the rhino in this region, as well as, you know, all over the world really at this point. Um, also helping with rehabilitation efforts. And then we're also working with a local organization where typically students are doing a community stay or community home stays, learning more about, um, again, sustainable farming in this region, especially why people are often leaving rural areas to go to cities and how that's impacting food sustainability in a lot of these regions. So um, learning about that and as well as immersing in the culture in Uganda. Next up, we are in Kenya, we have a secondary education program that students are working with um, in Kenya, where they are, it's called Daraja Academy. It's Kenya's first free all-girls secondary school. Uh, it's a really inspiring mission of this school. And so our students get to basically stay on the grounds for a week. They pair up with a girl. They shadow her through her classes and um, just learning more about the education system in Kenya. And that has been partnered with working at a primary school and learning more about, um, you know, the differences between public and private education in Kenya, especially. Um, also, while at the Daraja Academy, students get to take some Swahili lessons, which is fun to try to dig into that very unique language. Next up, we have Safari on the Maasai Mara. Um, so this is in Kenya. It is kind of, I don't know, it, the Serengeti and the Maasai Mara are connected, but the Maasai Mara is the Kenyan side. So students do get to go on Safari on a three-day game drive in these fun little 4 by 4 vehicles. Um, looking for hopefully the big five, the elephant, Cape buffalo, lion, leopard, and rhino. Uh, we certainly have had good, good luck in the past with students actually getting to see all of those animals. Um, really unique experience, obviously. And then they also spend a week building and installing solar energy systems into rural Maasai homes. So these are often homes that have never had access to electricity before. Um, super important for just, you know, the access to opportunities for some of these communities, especially as a lot of the currency and education is moving online. Having power and access to that in the home is huge. So kind of learning more about why that's so important, but also installing the systems that last for a very long time for these families. 
Next up in Tanzania, students do get to work in a public health clinic. Um, again, COVID permitting, but this is a really unique opportunity for students. It's a small rural clinic that actually focuses in snake bites. Um, so they have a lot of antivenoms. They do see snake bites in, this in these communities that live, you know, really rural. Um, and they're treating those people. So our students get to shadow the nurses and sometimes get to help, you know, with very minimal tasks around the clinic, but just learning more about a rural public health clinic and what that looks like in this region. Um, additionally, they're working at the, you know, learning about the local Maasai Cultural Heritage Center, a local market, and they also get to help out in the Adult Education Center where they're doing often English tutoring for families and such. So um, it's, a, it's a multifaceted project here, but there's a lot going on in this place. Um, super awesome for our students. And then lastly, finishing in Zanzibar. So this is the island I mentioned off the coast of Tanzania. Um, pretty spectacularly beautiful with the white sand beaches and the turquoise water, but also a really unique history that is associated with Zanzibar. So students are learning more about that history, the many different cultures and, and people that have transited through um, Stonetown over, over many, 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 many years. Um, they get to do a spice tour. Zanzibar is known for its spices and Stonetown itself is just a super unique city with um, an influx of, you know, former Muslim influences and Indian influences, and it has created a really unique kind of history, culture, food, all of that. So really awesome place to finish out this program. Next up, we have our Pacific Island semester. This one is unfortunately one we have not brought back just yet since COVID, but we are hoping to bring it back this fall of 2022. This program trans travels to Fiji, Sumatra, and Bali, and it is a fall and spring semester program. First up in Sumatra, we do have our orangutan conservation project. Um, this is where students are volunteering with a local nonprofit that is working to protect the critically endangered orangutan. So they're going trekking in the Sumatran rainforest in search of orangutans. Often our students do get to see them, which is really special. And then additionally, they're doing a homestay in a local community um, and have an opportunity to compare, compare cultures throughout all of these different locations. There are a lot of homestays on this program as it typically runs, um, part of why we haven't been able to bring it back just yet, but a lot of cultural immersion is a piece of this program. Additionally, we have our Lake Toba immersion um, experience. So students spend a day kayaking out on Lake Toba. This is a very large lake, which has a small island in the middle where students get to stay on the island in the middle of the lake and learn about the culture. They do a homestay in this coffee farming village, um, learning more about the coffee making process as was pictured before. Um, and then it, the, the name of the people here is Batak. So they get to immerse in the Batak tribe and um, just learn more, you know, lend a hand on some various projects in the community, but really just immerse and spend time with the local community members. Next up in Bali, students do get to do surf lessons um, and explore Ubud, which is really kind of a, a main hub in Bali. Um, super fun, a little bit more touristy, but just getting to experience Ubud and doing the surfing lessons on the beautiful beaches of Uluwatu in, in Bali. Um, and then students also get to participate in a traditional water purification ceremony here at Balinese Water Purification. As pictured here, they often, the you know, our, our partners want to dress, so you have to wear this traditional dress to go to the water purification ceremony. Um, it's a pretty cool sort of local uh, tradition to be able to be a part of. We also do our East Bali Immersion Program. So this is a an kind of entrepreneurial center um, for the East Bali Cashew Company. So students are learning about this small organization, um, how they have, you know, how they've become such a great success um, and how they partnered with a, a local community to create that success. And they also get to participate in a farm to fork, farm to table experience um, that starts with fishing at dawn with our local partners. And um, yeah, just learning more about food systems here. And lastly, we do have a coral reef restoration project um, that happens in Fiji where students are working alongside local university students on, a, on this rehabilitation project where they're basically kind of planting coral, um, but also learning about reef restoration um, and learning about the current status of this underwater ecosystem. And uh, additionally, getting their Patty Scoop certification on a pretty remote Fijian island. Um, so pretty, pretty spectacular way to round up this semester. Next up, we have our Southeast Asia program, which travels to Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia. And this is a fall and spring program. So a few of the highlights here, just to dig into it. In Thailand, students do get to stay at a Buddhist monastery um, and also take Muay Thai lessons. So when they do the group stay, they get to learn about meditation, about the history of Buddhism, potentially doing some yoga, and just experiencing the daily life of a monk at the monastery. 
Um, additionally, yes, the, the Muay Thai lessons have been really fun in the past for students, just more a fun, immersive opportunity uh, in digging further into the culture here in Thailand. Next up, students do get to do a nature reserve and elephant conservation project. So this is a really unique project where students are staying at, a, at this nature reserve that is all focused on sustainability, um, kind of living with the land, and creating, they're working also to create good corridors for tra travel for elephants to, um, you know, kind of reduce the human elephant conflict. But additionally, students get to work at an actual elephant conservation center where they do a trek through the jungle with the elephants or a walk. They get to help bathe them in the river, make food for them and feed them, and kind of just learn what the people who are working with elephants at the conservation center are doing and also what they're doing to, you know, protect uh, elephants in Thailand. Students then do a, a Thai rice field homestay. Again, this is, you know, homestays are COVID permitting for us right now, but assuming that we can bring them back, um, do a homestay in a rice farming village. So students basically are out in, in the fields every day learning how, how to farm rice, um, a big piece of, of the economy there in Thailand. Um, so they're, it's an immersive opportunity. They're planting and harvesting the rice, depending on the season, of course. And then they're also doing their scuba certification course on a very small island off the coast of Thailand called Koh Nang Wan. Uh, it's a really special, special place and it's quite small and intimate and they get to take their scuba lessons here, um, which is, is just a beautiful, a beautiful opportunity. And then in Vietnam, we do have a, a kind of classroom education pro project that students are doing um, where they are helping to, you know, facilitate classroom support for the for the teachers in this region, um, shadowing st students at the school, and this is primarily for students who have been impacted by Agent Orange from the from the, the from the Vietnam War. So students are also meeting with war veterans, um, learning about the history of what they refer to as the American War in Vietnam, um, and and also doing their kayaking in Lan Ha Bay, which is um, another fun adventure activity that they get to do. Um, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and they also get to sleep out on a traditional junk, which is a boat um, in Lan Ha Bay. And lastly on this list is Cambodia. So um, this is one of, I think, one of the most amazing projects we have, our Clean Water Filters Project in Cambodia, where students are basically building and installing these biosand water filters that provide clean water for families for up to 40 years. Huge piece of the you know, public health, having access to clean water, mitigating disease. Um, so kind of learning more about the, the, the multifaceted issues around water um, and having clean water in this region. And then also visiting, of course, Angkor Wat, um, doing a, a, a tour of the ruins, learning about the history of this ancient, uh, ancient wonder, and um, often doing it for sunrise, which is, which is pretty spectacular. Alrighty, next up, and then actually last on our list, is our South America program. This program travels to Chile and Patagonia, as well as Peru, and is a fall and spring semester program. First and foremost, we have Machu Picchu. Uh, can't go to Peru without visiting Machu Picchu, of course. So students do get to take the, the incredible train through the Sacred Valley that goes to the town of Aguas Calientes at the base of Machu Picchu um, and do a fully guided tour of the ruins. Um, especially right now since COVID, actually, they're, they've been limiting the number of people that can be in the ruins. So it's been a really unique time to visit Machu Picchu. Uh, students have kind of felt like they have it all to themselves, which is not something that you see often there. And then additionally, we have the Llama Pack project that students are, are doing here in the Sacred Valley, where we are working with an organization. Um, they're camping up in a remote high altitude community and learning about how this organization is promoting the sustainable use of llamas as pack animals, um, not only for sustainability of the environment, but also as an economic opportunity for folks to get involved in the, in the tourist industry um, in these more remote communities. In Peru, we also get to visit Lake Titicaca, it's the largest high altitude lake in the world. Um, students are learning about the Uros floating islands pictured here, made out of bundles of Satoro reeds. So people are living on these floating islands in, in the middle of the lake, it's super unique. Um, students also get to go kayaking on the lake and do a homestay on the, on the shores of Lake Titicaca, not on, not on the Uros floating islands, um, but doing a homestay, really digging more into um, the culture there. And then they also do get to do homestays and a Spanish language school in the Sacred Valley, um, digging more into Spanish and, um, you know, kind of setting up a foundation for the rest of the program so that they can engage more fully in the, in the culture as they learn the language. And then some highlights for Patagonia, students do get to go whitewater rafting on the Futalafu River. 
this is an, the, it's a turquoise river. It's, it's absolutely spectacularly beautiful. Um, they get to uh, venture out on the Carretera Austral, which is one of the, you know, quote, known as a well-known and famous road trip to do in South America. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, the students are only in Chilean Patagonia for this program, so on the Chilean side of Patagonia. But additionally, they get to partner with the um, Chile's newest national park, Parque Patagonia. It was some land that was purchased by the Tompkins Foundation, um, which is, you know, Doug Tompkins, who founded the North Face. They have since donated this land to the Chilean government to be a national park. So our students get to visit the national park, go for a hike, um, learn more about the history of this park and just conservation in general in Patagonia. And lastly, they go down to the southernmost region of Patagonia, and students do get to do a five-day trip, the W Trek in Torres del Paine National Park. Uh, it is one of the most famous treks in Patagonia. I've done it myself. It is incredible. Um, so they're just exploring, soaking up the, the turquoise waters, the vast peaks, um, everything that is so beautiful down there. And then students also are actually working with an organization that works in the park to do invasive species removal and reforestation from some fires that happened about five or six years ago in the park. Um, so learning about conservation and also getting to explore and recreate in the national park. Alrighty, so that was all of our programs. I know that that was a lot of information to take in. So we have had a couple of questions that have come up during this time period. So somebody did ask for a little bit more clarification about the application process as well as deadlines. So for our application process, basically as soon as you're ready to enroll in a program, you can go to our website. There is a red enroll now button, which allows you to submit the initial application for the program, as well as the $800 deposit if desired. After that point, um, the director for that program, either Emily, Sophia, or myself, will follow up and send the detailed application and the two to three reference forms. Once we've re received all of those materials back, then we do reach out to set up a time for your interview, and then we send official acceptance thereafter. As for deadlines, we do not have any deadlines for application. It is on a rolling basis, and it's all based on availability on our program. So we do encourage you, as soon as you feel confident that this is the right fit for you, it doesn't hurt to go ahead and just kind of get the process moving so as to not lose that spot. We also had a question about food and water. So food on our programs, it is safe, it's going to be healthy, it is going to be three meals a day with snacks to supplement in between. And in terms of water, especially for our international programs, we do on the packing list have students bring a way to purify their own water as we're traveling. Um, we used to buy bottled water and that just is, is really wasteful. And we found these water purification techniques are very safe for students to use and do help mitigate a lot of that traveler sickness that folks can get while traveling abroad. There's a question about what do colleges think of the gap year? So colleges are definitely becoming more accepting, if not supportive of the gap year option. They've seen, you know, how much more engaged and ready and independent students are when they're coming in after a gap experience versus straight from high school. So a lot of colleges are becoming more and more accepting, I think, especially since COVID and, you know, going online, they've had to, you know, be a lot more flexible with deferrals. So we're definitely seeing uh, really positive responses to that here from colleges. There was a question about whether or not you can speak to alumni references. Absolutely. We have alumni who are eager to chat with prospective students and families. Um, so if you are interested in a specific program, just let us know and we are happy to send you some alumni references as well as their parents' contact information uh, so that you can reach out and kind of get the sense for what it's really like on the program for those students. There's a question about accommodation. So I know I mentioned on the domestic programs that it's primarily going to be camping. Those programs do have some mix of indoor accommodations that are mixed in throughout the semester, whether that be an Airbnb or a bunkhouse. So there is some indoor accommodation on those. For our international programs, it is primarily going to be hostels and hotels when students are in bigger city centers. Um, and then in, in rural communities, it's either homestays or if it is some sort of group community stay, they might be in a bunkhouse or some sort of basic community lodging. Sometimes that might mean camping out on the floor of the school or, or something of that nature. Um, but certainly a mixture of different accommodations, especially on the international programs. Um, with the exception of the East Africa program, as well as the South America program, have a good bit of camping. Um, in South America, that's really just in the Patagonia section, and in East Africa, that's much of the program, as I mentioned. And then we also had a question about whether or not we offer fall and spring semesters. Can you do your full year with ARC GAP? The answer is yes, you absolutely can. Um, some of our pro uh, some of our programs are only offered in the fall, summer, fall, and spring. Um, so it's worth noting on the website just which, which programs are offered when so that you can get a sense. Um, but we do have options for you to spend the whole, whole year with us if you'd like. 
And it looks like we also had a question just about kind of, you know, political context and COVID regulations. So we are certainly monitoring what the entry regulations are for any country that we are planning to travel to. Um, as I mentioned before, of course, if anything were to change politically or if there were to be a border that closes down or, um, you know, a change in regulations or a natural disaster or something, uh, we've been operating programs in these regions for a long time. We are fortunately able to pivot pretty quickly when it comes to needing to change an itinerary for any of those things. So, you know, we're monitoring entry regulations. We help navigate, help families navigate what those look like for each country. Um, and we are also always able to change our itineraries um, at the drop of a hat if needed. All right, so I think that's all the questions that I've had handed to me thus far that have come in. Um, I hope that you've gotten a good sense of our programs from this webinar this evening. And of course, if you would like to learn more, there are a number of ways to do so. So our website is a great, a great resource. Um, you know, we do have journal entries from previous groups. There's videos for some of the programs, maps, blog entries, um, photos. Um, there's also online reviews as well. So definitely a lot that you can get, can get there. As always, feel free to call our office and ask to speak with Emily, Sophia, or myself. We are always happy to answer your questions or provide references, as I mentioned. So thank you so much again for participating in the webinar this evening. I know how crazy school nights might be, but we really appreciate your time, and I hope that this has proved useful. Otherwise, we look forward to being in touch.